My name is Shelito Habito. Everybody calls me Shell. Uh, once upon a time, I was in the position that our keynote speaker was, is in now as uh, head of the NEDA and therefore the socioeconomic planning secretary. But I, I call that prehistoric era, anything bef before the year 2000, which is when I was the head of NEDA. It's uh, prehistoric already by now. Anyway, right now, I, I had also until recently been a faculty member of the Ateneo de Manila University, but I finally retired uh, two months ago after 23 years in the, in the university. So right now, uh, I'm heading a 20-year-old company called Brain Trust Inc., uh, a multidisciplinary group that actually does development work. We've been advising uh, the government through international agencies or directly as, uh, as direct uh, contractors of, uh, of work that they uh, contract out. In fact, currently we're working with the Department of Social Welfare and Development to evaluate all the social protection programs of the government and another one with the Department of Agriculture to evaluate the extension system, particularly the learning sites for agriculture, just to give you a flavor of what we're doing right now, but we've done a lot of other things in the past 20 years. Well, I did have a couple of, a few slides. Uh, essentially to, uh, again, with the, with the task of uh, being a discussant to Dr. Valyasindi. Um, well, let me take off from the, where are we now? Okay, that's the title page. Um, well, I guess I wanted to situate first our country against that global picture that she painted to us. Of course, the general uh, picture is a slowdown for so many reasons, including geopolitical uh, factors. And uh, anyway, I won't go into that. She exp I remember her, her slide with six red frames and two green frames, so more bad news than good news. And by the way, in my own slides, I usually have good news in blue because I used to be an Ateneo professor <laughs> and the bad news in green. <laughs> But in, now, well, now there's good news and bad news in general about the Philippines situated against that picture she drew of the world. The good news is that in, if you look at the three major spending uh, units of the economy based on the, the, the expenditure account of GDP, it's good news on government spending. In fact, our growth has been led primarily by government spending. We've also had brisk consumer spending except that the inflation lately had uh, slowed that uh, or dampened that a little bit. But we've also had export growth. And surprisingly, we have been growing 6.3% in the first semester in our exports, in spite of the 3.2, I think is the figure said, for global trade. So I believe it's because we have been able to, to look for opportunities as a small country for export opportunities in the world market. So it tells us that we need not be stopped by the global, uh, uh, global slowdown in trade. The, the bad news actually is in private investment. And this has been slow, slower than the historical because of three things. Well, the traditional hurdles to the ease of doing business are the weak, and again, man, this was mentioned by Dr. Valyasandi, uh, weak reliability and or the higher cost of vital infrastructure like energy, telecoms, and logistics and then, of course, again, high interest rates, which, however, seems to be now in a period of easing up. So, so I'll, take off, I'll take off from the three imperatives that I got from Dr. Valles in this uh, presentation. Enhance the efficiency of public investment, boost human capital, and strengthen resilience and inclusion. So let me, let me quickly take uh, the first. Enhance efficiency of public investment. There are challenges and imperatives in each of these three that she had talked about. On, again, on public investment efficiency, our problem has been for some years or many years now, a rather bad absorption or burn rate by our infrastructure agencies. I haven't looked at it most recently, but when I, I've been examining the Commission on Audit reports on DPWH, Public Works, and DOTR, and for years, uh, Public Works was only spending about one-fourth of their entire budget several, for several years. And, I'm oh, sorry, it was about one-third. And then the OTC, or D, which became DOTR, Transport, was only spending about a fourth, a quarter of their budget for the year. So how can you actually boost 
a public investment uh, in terms of real infrastructure if the absorptive capacity, it seems, of our infrastructure agencies is low. Second, there are questionable priorities and allocation of that public investment, particularly the infrastructure budget. Many of us know about this seemingly senseless reblocking that happens along roads, roads which are perfectly okay being dug up again to repave them. And for the life of me, I can't understand why they have to do that. They're doing that right now in my town in Los Baños. Road, a road that they had just fixed about three years ago, they dug it up again and repave it. So anyway, <laughs> I think we all could guess what the reason might be, which leads to the third reason, the large leakages in our public investment funds. And again, this is the challenge that we continue to face. Now, what do we need to do? Well, I guess what this implies, if our infrastructure agencies can't do the work fast enough, rely more on private sector, PPPs. No? And the problem really is that we want to make sure that our PPPs are more of the solicited kind so that government really can assert it is a priority project. We've had more of the unsolicited uh, PPP projects in past years, which became problematic, uh, many of them. So this has to be based on a firm infrastructure strategy and plan and on which the government should be able to prepare precisely the solicited bids. Second, enhance the quality, and this came from Dr. Vellasi in this paper, enhance infrastructure quality, including higher energy efficiency, and in our case, public housing expansion and improvement to fill a large unmet need for housing in our country. And this is persistent. Uh, we all know about the scandalous uh, fact that there are thousands of unoccupied or unutilized housing units that have actually been built. And as we know, there was a group that actually forcefully took over these houses because of the, the ways that they were seeing. Now, on the second, on boosting human capital, the challenges are something I've been talking about a lot in recent years, malnutrition and child stunting, which I call our demographic time bomb uh, to, to take off from the usual assertion that we have a demographic sweet spot of uh, a predominantly young population. Our generally weak public health system gets in the way and of course, again, Dr. Town, the education crisis where we, the World Bank has indicated we have a 91% learning poverty. And of course, we all know about the PISA rankings where 15-year-old uh, Filipinos rank at the bottom in reading, uh, math, and science across the world in terms of uh, ability in these uh, subjects. The imperatives are to zero in on the first 1,000 days because it's stunting which has lifelong damage for children. 90% of brain development happens before age five. So a severely malnourished child at five, uh, five years old is damaged for life. It has obviously uh, effects on our future uh, labor productivity as a country. Education reforms are being undertaken. I happen to be part of one of the standing committees of the EDCOM or the Second Educational Commission. We hope to be able to contribute to fixing many of the things that we see wrong. And then, again, as mentioned by Secretary Balisakan, accelerate our shift to innovation and adoption and infusion of modern technologies. And Secretary Balisakan heads the National in uh, Innovation Council. They have now a national innovation agenda and a strategy document to guide our uh, efforts on that. And finally, on the third aspect, third recommendation, this is on the strengthening resilience and inclusion. The challenges are the high, we have the highest vulnerability to climate change and extreme weather, also mentioned, already mentioned by, by our speaker. And of course, we, have, we grapple with unsustainable and irresponsible production and consumption practices. We've all heard about how we are one of the largest sources of plastic pollution in the ocean, so that's on the consumption side. And a skewed economic growth, where there is a lack of small business contribution, micro, small, and medium enterprises, compared to, say, Indonesia and Thailand, whose, uh, uh, whose MSMEs contribute a far greater percentage of GDP and jobs in those countries. And even geographic inclusion, where our GDP is primarily concentrated in the national capital region and the surrounding provinces. So what are our imperatives? Well, support those MSMEs. And of course, that's, in the, that's including small farms, more with public goods assistance, not pri private goods assistance, which in effect gets government competing with the private sector. And that includes, by the way, financial inclusion, access to finance. I like to argue that a good uh, access to finance is a public good 
that is worth paying taxpayers' money for, to give wide access to finance to small business, small farms. And then we have to reconfigure our economic governance for greater economic freedom. That means more rational regulation and a change in mindset in our regulators. You know, I, I've always felt that our regulatory agencies seem to think that they're doing, doing their job well the more hurdles they throw in your way. And that's exactly why our, that's why our uh, small business uh, sector in particular is struggling to the point of uh, choking under the documentary requirements of satisfying those regulations. And then, uh, again, economic governance towards more economic and political contestability. And finally, social mobility, another prescription of uh, Dr. Valisandi. In our case, it's uh, education, uh, again, MSME development, and agriculture development, which I call the backbone of our economy and the most inclusive sector. I'll stop there, and of course, we can have a more discussion uh, after this. Thank you very much.